Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Research at Home. And uh, we are finishing the week um, this week with uh, Tom Rees and Jen Barker, uh, who are from Ambition Institute. So um, they're going to be talking to us today about developing ex uh, expertise in leadership, um, which is quite interesting because we've, we've picked up on that theme earlier on in the week with Carly Waterman. So I'm really, really quite intrigued to see um, where this leads us today. Um, so Tom is Executive Director of School Leadership at Ambition. Uh, and Jen is uh, Dean of Learning Design, so she knows a thing or two about CPD. Um, so without further ado, Tom and Jen, if you're ready, we'll go to you. Yeah, thank you. Great, great. thank you. Thanks very much. And morning, everyone. Um, it's, it's great to be here. Uh, as, as you've heard, I am uh, Dean of Learning for um, Ambition Institute, and I work on our school leadership programmes um, prior to to, to working at Ambition, I, I, was a, I was a school leader for, for eight years uh, in, in a couple of schools in, in Manchester. And Tom and I are going to be here uh, talking to you about uh, school leadership. So whether you're here live or whether you are watching this back on YouTube, uh, it's, it's great to be with you. So we'll, we'll be talking to you about um, expertise in school leadership. And we're going to start the session by painting a picture of what has been termed the orthodoxy in school leadership. That is to say that there's been a focus on generic traits and competencies. And whilst we think these factors are important, um, evidence suggests that focusing on these traits or competencies isn't actually going to enable leaders to have the most impact in their work. And, and nor actually does evidence suggest that these traits are particularly easy to develop. Indeed, research tells us that uh, personality traits are, are thought to be largely fixed. And so we want to try and redress this balance by using research to conceptualise school leadership and its development in a, in a different way. And to do this, we pr propose a simple model whereby if leaders have a, a good understanding of the persistent problems of their role and uh, they have the knowledge to solve those problems, then combined, those, they, they enable the development and use of, of really rich mental models which can be thought of as what people know and how that knowledge is organised to guide action. Uh, and for those of you who like what you hear today and want to hear more, uh, you can get a copy of the Research Ed Guide to Leadership, for which we have written uh, the first couple of chapters. One very quick uh, just logistical note, you, you may want to um, minimise if the, if the, the, the um, image speakers uh, or the, the speakers of the image, sorry, are on the right hand side, you may want to um, just minimise that because it, they, they, they actually cover, we think, some of the writing on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, and now I'm going to hand over to Tom to uh, introduce himself and explain what injecting an orange and the flight simulator have in common. Yeah, thanks Jen. Good morning everyone. It's really nice to, to be here uh, virtually at Research Ed today. So on the picture, uh, on the screen we've got two pictures. We've got uh, an orange uh, with, a, with a needle and a flight simulator on the right hand side. So, so these are images of someone practicing taking blood uh, from an orange on the left and on the right we see a pilot who's learning to fly in a simulator with a co-pilot next to them who's able to uh, advise them. Uh, and if this was a, a plane and beyond the simulator a co-pilot would be there who'd be able to um, take the controls if necessary to help guide and, and advise uh, as the pilot learns to become uh, more expert. So in both these cases, we see important, difficult tasks being performed that we don't just learn naturally, uh, and we, which require training and practice. And before someone is allowed to take blood or land a plane, they have to have lots of opportunities to practice this uh, before they can do it without, without supervision. So here are two more pictures. This is uh, Jen and I, uh, yeah, a few years ago now, both at the, in different leadership roles uh, in schools. So on the left, this is me in my first term as a head teacher, looking very pleased with myself and my two screens in the background uh, in 2008, uh, and Jen here in 2013 uh, as an assistant head. And in both our cases, we look back really fondly at our time as school leaders, and we think that through experience, we became uh, more effective. But in contrast to the examples that we looked at on the previous slide, we reflect that we often met really difficult challenges for the first time when they were live without having uh, had the opportunities uh, to experience them in a, in a simulator or a practice environment. 
And this means that lots of our learning took place um, through trial and error uh, and making uh, mistakes. And certainly in my experience as a head teacher, um, I got better at my job over the years because I picked up lots of knowledge along the way, um, lots of it by accident, um, some of it through my own reading and interest. And there are things uh, I stumbled on in recent years that I wish I'd known um, about much earlier on in my leadership uh, journey, that essential knowledge for, for running a school. So our job at the moment is to think about how we design professional development for thousands of school leaders each year, uh, how we use the really limited time and attention that school leaders have available uh, most effectively to make sure they're as prepared as possible to run their department or their school or group of schools. That's something that's really motivating um, and it's great to have the opportunity to learn alongside people like Jen uh, and the team at Ambition to think about how we can um, develop uh, school leaders in the future. So in our talk today, we're going to break this down into to four parts. Uh, firstly, we're going to ask the question, what is school leadership? And we're going to look at expertise and how we might learn from how um, other experts um, in different fields get better in their roles. And then we're going to introduce this model around persistent problems, knowledge and expert uh, mental models. And they're terms that we'll explain a bit more uh, about uh, as we go through the talk. OK, so let's dive in uh, on this question. What is school leadership? So just over a year ago, when Jen and I started uh, to work together. Um, this was a, a big question for us around what school leadership is. And to try and understand it more, uh, we looked in lots of different places. So we, uh, we read lots of books. Um, we read uh, as many research papers as, as we could get our hands on. We spoke to lots of practice, um, practicing uh, head teachers and school leaders, lots of people with lots of experience um, or retired uh, school leaders. We also um, talked to people who had delivered uh, leadership training uh, to find out more uh, about this question and another thing that we were really interested in was the the narrative around school leadership the way it's talked about um, the kind of discourse uh, uh, around it uh, and one of the places that was interesting was to look at the the adverts for uh, school leader roles so in the the tes um, uh, and what the things are that governing bodies or trusts and employers were, were looking for and so here are some, uh, what we found first of all is that generally leaders are described through adjectives. So um, people ask for a leader who is this, this, uh, or this. Uh, and these, um, th th this language that I'm gonna share with you now is from some random adverts that we found uh, on the TES um, when we looked last year, I'll let you read these, uh, these words. So this language is interesting. Um, words like dynamic, um, motivational, charismatic, interpersonal, um, inspiring. Um, I, I, and it's hard to think, isn't it, of a, a human being who could possibly claim to be all, the, all of these things. How could you sort of write a, a letter of application, for example, with a, with a straight face claiming to be uh, all, all, the, all, these different, um, uh, all these different things? It kind of leads us towards uh, the, the hero paradigm uh, of school leadership where we want these kind of visionary uh, inspiring characters to to lead our schools and it also doesn't seem plausible that these traits and behaviors necessarily stack up as the most important things that we want uh, the people running our schools to be so there's no mention here of, of experience of being knowledgeable about lots of issues within a school or being thoughtful or being more expert being able to do um, important things well uh, within a school so if school leadership's more than, than uh, language like this, well, what is it? I'll let you uh, read this slide. And this quote um, highlights the lack of clarity about what school leadership is. And um, uh, there's one consensus in the field of school leadership is that there isn't a consensus about um, uh, what the thing actually is and it's inconvenient really for people like us who are trying to think about how we uh, can build a curriculum for school leaders to develop because how can you help people to get better at something if you uh, can't first define the thing that we want them uh, to get better at so in answer to this question what is school leadership well really the answer is 
it's complicated, it's complex. There's no clear agreed on definition. Often uh, we see it focuses on the traits and characteristics and behaviors, um, or it can focus on the roles. So researchers have talked about um, leadership in many different ways, or the systems and the positions of, uh, of office. It's also a relatively recent term in education. So for example, when I first took on uh, uh, responsibility outside of the classroom in 2001, uh, I was called a coordinator. I was a key stage two coordinator and I was paid a, a management point. And I was part of a senior management team. And then by the time that Jen uh, took on uh, responsibility in 2006, she had the far grander title of um, key stage leader. She was a leader and she was part of a, a school leadership team. And so the, um, the increase of this uh, language about um, leadership has, has developed over the years, and uh, in particular through the, through, the, through the noughties, the work of the National College of School Leadership really brought the, um, the language of leadership to a prominent place within education, uh, and also sort of more widely in society, uh, the leadership movement has, um, has developed, uh, and uh, the language is really common both wider in society and within, um, uh, within uh, industry. And some researchers have been quite critical of, of, of the field, saying that um, it's been dominated by um, abstract uh, theories of, of leaderships. This is Robinson and Gray in 2019. We're going to look at some of the work of Vivian Robinson uh, in a little while. But first to look at some of the different definitions of school leadership and what the research says. So this slide uh, indicates uh, a paper in 2018 which looked at the variety of different models that had been studied. And uh, over the 30 years uh, leading um, between 1980 and 2014, there were a thousand different papers that were, that were looked at here, which presented 14 different leadership models. And you can see some of the common theories such as transformational leadership, instructional leadership and distributed leadership, um, and some kind of less uh, common uh, theories there, but ones that you often hear about, such as charismatic leadership or ethical leadership, authentic or, or servant uh, leadership. And it's easy to see why school leadership has been criticised for being um, leadership by adjective or the alphabet soup of school leadership, as it's described by uh, John McBeath. And one of the most common theories is transformational leadership. And this is a theory which promotes the role of the leader as influencer who builds followers who are then motivated to achieve common goals. This theory, as Jen uh, mentioned earlier, is often seen as the orthodoxy within uh, school leadership and has been criticised for its role in creating a, a hero paradigm where, where leaders are often um, seen as saviours and we can celebrate their personality over expertise. So with all these different um, theories and lack of consensus about a definition, uh, we can think of um, uh, the field of school leadership as a low validity domain. Uh, and what we mean by that is that it's hard to say with any certainty what causes what, and that lots of the studies show no causal link between particular uh, actions or behaviours and their impact. So let's take the example of basketball. So if I was playing basketball, and I was taking some, some shots, I'd be able to get some pretty immediate feedback on how successful I was being. And I'd also be able to see how, as I changed my actions and inputs, that changed my level of success. So depending on if I put more or less weight into the shot, or if I kind of uh, move things in different ways, I'd be able to get that feedback and I'd be able to get um, reasonable, um, uh, I'd be able to reasonably interpret how successful the, the moves I made were, were changing things. Whereas in school leadership, it's, much, um, it, it's an example of a much harder domain to track the, the link between the moves that you make, uh, the decisions that you take, and the, uh, the impact that they have, particularly when the impact that we think about having on, on children is something that we, we won't really know until many, many years um, uh, in, in advance as they've kind of grown up into to, to adult life. Uh, and it's... Uh, so Helen at the start talked about Carly Waterman's talk on, on Tuesday and one of the quotes that I really loved uh, Carly used there was that she said we should be suspicious of certainty when people talk about 
um, school leadership. And I thought that was a, a, good, uh, a, a good check um, and, and a helpful thing to think about. So the work of Vivian Robinson, we think, is, is really uh, helpful. And we were fortunate to, to meet Vivian when she came to, to London last year. She visited uh, as an amb ambition. She's a, a researcher from New Zealand. She's written lots of um, books and studies over uh, lots of years. Um, and, uh, and her work, she says that um, consistently she's argued for a shift in emphasis in research into school leadership. Uh, she says it's been dominated for 15 years by generic approaches. And she acknowledges that, um, uh, that this research can be helpful and is important, but that a fresh focus on the leadership of teaching and learning has the potential to put education back into educational leadership, which is to ground leadership in the core business of teaching and learning. And Robinson says that school leaders need to be increasingly knowledgeable about the core business of these things, teaching, learning, assessment, and curriculum. Uh, and in her work, um, she identifies three central capabilities. So she says that school leaders uh, need to use their educational knowledge to solve complex problems in ways that build trust uh, with those around them. I think that's uh, a helpful definition to think about um, the work of school leaders and the things that they, that they, that they do. So building on Robinson's definition of, of generic leadership, we want to just explore this a bit further as it's uh, central to uh, the debate. Um, so let's explore a bit about this idea of generic leadership. So first of all, um, we can think of this as ideas and concepts that come from uh, the field of leadership. So the idea that if we become good at the practice of leadership, this will lead to positive outcomes in whichever setting it is um, that we work in. This can often be rooted in transformational leadership theory, where leaders are seen as um, influencers, builders of followers. And we can see two dominant ways that generic leadership manifests itself within, um, within school le uh, leadership um, training and within the narrative. Firstly, is through the traits or the characteristics of an individual, such as the adverts that we, that we saw earlier. And secondly, through a focus on general leadership Con, uh, concepts or practices, things such as creating a vision, making change, or being a, a good communicator. So let's take this first point, first of all, where leadership can focus on the traits or characteristics of an individual, such as their charisma, their confidence, or optimism. So back in 2008, an influential paper was published called Seven Strong Claims About School Leadership. And this made a strong claim that there were a handful, a small handful of personal traits that explained the difference between successful and less successful leaders. However, last year, the authors published a review of the evidence 10 years later, and they acknowledged that there was insufficient evidence to support this claim. They wrote that, the claim that personal leadership traits by themselves explain a high proportion of variation in school leadership effectiveness cannot be justified. And so we don't see any strong evidence that says that a focus on personality type is a worthy uh, focus for us in leadership development. Uh, these traits, when they're detached from uh, the knowledge required in any given setting, don't make it clear what leaders need to do, nor do they, um, uh, they help us in thinking about how we build a, a curriculum for leadership uh, development. And so we think that a focus on the sort of um, uh, personality or characteristics or traits uh, is unhelpful for three reasons. Firstly, we don't know which particular characteristics are more desirable than others. So lots of people have presented different lists, but there's no convincing evidence that draws a causal link between your personality type and your success as a school leader. There are challenges around a validity construct of definitions of lots of those, um, those particular uh, traits or characteristics as well. The second point is that even if we did agree on a particular list of, of characteristics or traits, we don't know a lot about how we could develop them. Tests and self-analytical tools are often non-scientific and unreliable. And by the time people attend leadership professional development in their adult lives, their character and personalities are well-formed and, and largely fixed. And it's unlikely that even if we wanted to change someone's personality or character through a leadership uh, development programme, that, that, we, that we could. Uh, and finally, we think it's unhelpful to promote a view that there is any particular type um, of school leader or type of person that should be suited to be 
uh, to being a school leader. Uh, school leadership already has its challenges with, with diversity. And so to ensure that school leaders represent this kind of rich uh, diversity that exists across our school communities, we think it's important to avoid perpetuating any stereotypes. So the second point around generic uh, leadership here is a focus on a general competency. So these might be things such as uh, uh, having a vision, um, leading change, or, uh, or communication, those, those types of things. And often you hear this kind of general narrative, which is it doesn't matter whether you're leading a, a department or a school or a group of schools, essentially leadership's just the same. You need to learn these, gen uh, these general uh, leadership things. And, and again, as Robinson said, and as um, Jen said at the beginning of the talk, um, we're not saying that um, it's not helpful to, to think about these things and that there aren't things that we might learn um, that can be helpful in building a, a really rich uh, mental model that helps people become successful school leaders. But we do think that this um, focus has overlooked the importance of subject or domain specific knowledge. And that it's very hard to develop any of these types of skills without paying more attention to the area uh, it is in which you're leading. Um, so we're got, now gonna just have a, a quick walk through domain specific expertise. So domain specific expertise focuses on the, um, the knowledge and skills which are relevant to uh, a particular field or subject. Uh, and we, uh, we think and we think the evidence suggests that it is important that, um, that leaders draw on lots of knowledge from different subjects or specialist domains um, when they're making decisions or when they're making uh, changes or working with people uh, in the schools. And that often what we think of as, as generic leadership skills, things like um, uh, creating a vision or uh, communication or improvement work, uh, could be called, could call it change, is driven by a very rich uh, and deep knowledge uh, of some specialist domains. And let me, let me give you a concrete example. So my dad was a music teacher. He taught for 40 years and he retired last year for the fifth time uh, in about the last six or seven years. Um, and dad taught in lots of different um, music departments and has a really um, rich amount of knowledge and expertise which relates to, to music teaching. And if you were to set up a school and you were wanted some advice on how to set a music department up. My dad would be a really good person to come and advise. Um, he knows what good looks like. He knows what lots of the pitfalls are and the mistakes that can be made. Um, and he could be really helpful in um, helping you set up a, a music department. I'm not trying to um, sell my dad as consultant here, by the way. But, but it, would, it would be helpful knowledge and expertise to draw on in, in uh, leading that piece of work. And it might be that having worked with my dad in that setting that you would say, well, John is quite visionary. He was really visionary and, as, uh, and actually his vision allowed him to take people with him and, um, and, it, and he implemented change really, really well. Um, and so you could then say, well, because of those visionary skills and his ability to lead change, we'll get him to lead some other change. So you would take him over to the French department. Or we might take him down to look at uh, an early years uh, setting. And this is where dad would come unstuck because it was his rich background knowledge and expertise within that particular domain and his experience there that helped him um, to appear visionary and to lead successful change. Not that he had um, particular qualities in, um, uh, in change management or, or, or creating a vision that, that helped him. And so, um, so, we, so I'm not saying that there aren't things that we can learn that are helpful to apply to, to creating some general processes, but a lot of it, um, we think, uh, comes through having lots of uh, rich domain specific uh, knowledge. And there's a challenge of how things transfer from different subjects or areas. Um, and often we think we, we over assume that, that that can happen. Okay, so we've talked a bit about um, school leadership talked a bit uh, about it as a, being a, a low validity construct without a clear definition, suggested that the dominant narrative has been one rooted in transformational leadership where um, concepts such as vision and change have prevailed, where there's been this sort of pre preoccupation with traits and characteristics of individuals. And we've touched on some arguments um, about the importance of more expert knowledge or domain specific 
um, subject knowledge. Um, and if you're watching this back on, on YouTube, this might be a good point to pause and talk to people uh, around you about whether or not these things connect to your experience and to um, uh, uh, make some sense of that. Uh, and if you're not and it's live, I'm going to hand now to Jen, who's going to talk to us uh, about what we can learn from the field of expertise. Thanks, Tom. Um, and we're going to kick off with this quote from David Berliner, uh, who in 1988 wrote that experts are able to respond to complex challenges in their domain in fast, fluid and flexible ways. And we see uh, examples of expertise around us all the time. The current situation obviously is, is no different. We have doctors and nurses using years of training to ensure that patients are getting the best treatments. There are um, epidemiologists constructing detailed models to inform us how we should be behaving both now and, and, and in the future. Um, and, and researchers from, from a, a whole range of fields working incredibly quickly to develop uh, tests and, and, and treatments and, and vaccines. But of course, we're interested in um, expertise in school leadership. And we think that a helpful way to uh, understand this better is to break expertise down into its constituent parts so that we can better understand how to develop it. And this very simple model attempts to do just that. So we view expertise as a product of uh, a deep understanding of the persistent problems of a role. And we'll explain what those mean just a little later and the knowledge required to solve them. And combined, we think that these enable the development and use of really rich mental models. But first, let's take a look at what the literature says about expertise. So literature suggests that experts to a significant extent are made and not born. And that by and large expertise isn't predicated on uh, innate uh, traits or, or talents. Instead, Experts work to effortfully acquire their expertise, often over thousands and thousands of hours of practice, resulting in both automaticity and routinization of the tasks that are required to accomplish their work. Literature also suggests that expertise rests on a substantial knowledge base and that by and large, that it doesn't transfer well to other domains. So being an expert school leader, doesn't make you an, an expert in, in medicine or, or, or indeed um, wouldn't make you an expert in, in um, a university setting, despite obviously there being a similarity um, with, with, with schools and, and universities from an education perspective. Research also tells us that experts have both the ability to apply their knowledge to the work that they do, but also to create new knowledge in their domain because they're working right at the, at the forefront of their discipline. And experts are also more opportunistic and flexible in their work, which means that they can be more sensitive to the task demands and the social situation that they find themselves in. And this is a really important point because talking about knowledge as being integral to expertise can feel quite cold. But we can see from David Belena's work that having knowledge actually frees up a person to better understand and respond to the social situation which exists around any problem. And finally, um, evidence suggests that expertise um, develops along a continuum rather than being a, a binary distinction from a novice. And, and we think that's really important because um, we don't think it's necessarily helpful to class somebody as an expert, rather we think it more useful to think of expertise um, as a journey. And to be really clear about why it matters that teachers and leaders are experts, we know that teaching quality is, is really important. It, it, it's probably the biggest lever that we have uh, at our disposal to Im improve the life chances of pupils. And we have um, a number of research insights into the impact um, of leaders as well. And they include impact on pupil outcomes, where leadership is thought to produce gains of between five and seven percent, to uh, teacher retention, where effective principals retain the strongest teachers, they prioritise the development of all teachers, and they also lead schools where the strongest teachers are less likely to leave. And uh, to teacher satisfaction, where uh, better school leadership 
is more strongly associated with higher teacher job satisfaction and a reduction in the odds that the teacher will want to move schools. And so for all of these reasons, we think it's important to raise levels of expertise right across the system. And so if we know what it is that experts do, it could be really tempting to try and shortcut our journey to expertise, to, to look at the behaviours or actions of experts and try to um, imitate or, or, or mimic what they do. So let's take an example. So we know, or at least Tom knows, that uh, Johnny Wilkinson uh, can, can be considered an expert rugby kicker. Um, and, but depending on what aspect of uh, his performance we were to look at, we could end up if we wanted to try and improve our own rugby kicking, uh, we could end up focusing on features that are not going to help uh, develop our expertise. So we could kick left-footed, we could hold our hands together, we could always place the tee in the same way, we could try wearing tight shorts, um, and we could make sure that we take the same run up to the ball each time. Um, but in doing so, we're probably not going to get uh, any better at kicking. And this um, issue is really nicely illustrated by Greg Ashman in his critique of rubrics. In this diagram, if you if you can if you take the the, the solid red performance, solid red colour, sorry, to um, denote expert performance in a complex domain, and the blue dots to um, highlight certain features of expert performance. What, what we can see is that by focusing on only those uh, certain features, those blue dots, actually we, we risk losing the more um, nuanced and, and, and holistic view of, of expert performance. And the, the same thing happens in, in people's work. Um, we've all used rubrics and, and checklists, which highlight aspects, for example, of, of high quality writing. Um, and then children crafting a piece of writing that, that meets all of those, um, th those features, but actually doesn't necessarily make much sense. Uh, and the same thing can happen in leadership. Uh, as leaders, we are, of course, um, always looking for ways to improve the experience and outcomes of our pupils. And it's, it's really tempting to look at those who we think are doing a great job and try and, and, and emulate uh, their success. So consider the leader who visits a school doing amazing things for their pupils, uh, sees the, the fantastic displays that that school has to offer. Um, and uh, it, it's easy to think that um, you know th those displays are the thing that will uh, enable us to actually improve the, imp the, the performance of our, our, our own pupils. But of course, um, simply focusing on that, simply focusing on the displays is unlikely to lead to the um, improvements that we want to um, achieve. Thankfully, uh, there's a person whose research provides a really helpful antidote to this problem. And that's the work of Mary Kennedy, who in her 2016 paper said this. And, and in her work, Mary Kennedy, um, she splits the practice of teaching into five areas. Uh, portraying the curriculum, exposing student thinking, enlisting student participation, con containing student behaviour and accommodating personal needs. And, and that refers um, to the need for teachers to be able to teach in a way that reflects their own um, personal needs. And, and we've, we've thought about this and, and how we can use this lens and apply it to the work of leaders. And so um, I'm gonna hand over to Tom now to talk to you um, about what we mean by the idea of a persistent problem. Thanks, Jen. Uh, great. So, so this idea of leadership uh, as problem solving, as a way of looking at the, the purpose of, of leaders' work. Um, so this is not a new concept. So researchers have uh, used different definitions of problems uh, in the literature. So earlier in the presentation, for example, we looked at Vivian Robinson's three capabilities of school leaders, uh, which are that leaders use educational knowledge to solve complex problems in ways that build trust uh, with those around them. Now, the word problem can have negative connotations, and we want to be clear that we don't use it in this way. Uh, instead, we're using the word problem to address the core work of leaders in the way that um, Mary Kennedy uh, uses it. Uh, and this definition from Thomas Nichol, uh, Nichols is, is helpful. So he talks about problems as something that is a demand uh, with constraints, a set of constraints that prevent it from being achieved. 
And so uh, an example of this might be that all schools need to achieve um, uh, pupil learning. That's the, that's a, a, the demand. The constraints are, are numerous that prevent um, uh, pupil learning happening in, in an optimum way. Things like attention, uh, motivation, curriculum organisation, uh, all those, those types of things. So that, that's an example of a, uh, of a problem uh, uh, using this, this definition. A focus on problems might also lead us to think that it's generic problem solving skills that we need to develop. So if we can kind of get better at generally solving problems, um, this, this, this might be helpful. Um, so here we, we refer to the work uh, of Dan Willingham, um, who uh, talks about the, uh, the importance of the main specific knowledge in problem solving. So knowing a, a great deal about the, th about the thing, the area uh, that, that you're working on, the problem that you're trying uh, to solve. And we think that so lots of these demands, these, these problems are likely to be similar across schools. But an important point is that the constraints are likely to, to vary from one school to another, depending on the context uh, and all kinds of things uh, that, might be, that might be different. And it's for this reason that while we think there are some confident conclusions that we can draw from evidence, like things, uh, things like how children learn, for example, we need to be careful about how we adopt blanket approaches that have been successful in one school and move them to another school because of the importance of um, the different constraints that, that arise through context. So moving on to this, uh, this notion of persistent problems, we're trying to identify next uh, persistent problems of school leadership. So we think if we can set out, um, as Mary Kennedy did for, for teaching with her five problems, uh, persistent problems of teaching, the same for school leadership, and it's a helpful starting point for, for a curriculum. So we think persistent problems can be uh, identified through in three ways. Uh, firstly, that they're universal. So everyone who uh, teaches anywhere would, would, would meet this persistent problem. So, so one example would be um, uh, pupil behaviour. It doesn't matter whether you're a primary or a secondary school in this country or teaching in another country in a, a foreign language, um, you, you're going to have this same uh, persistent problem of, of uh, pupil behaviour. They're also intrinsic. Um, so they don't just happen everywhere. They're, they're unavoidable. You'll, you'll always have to be responding in some way to this, uh, this persistent problem. It's going to be something that drives your work. And no matter how good you get, you're always still going to have to um, respond to this problem. Uh, and finally, that they're useful. So um, if you get good at responding to this persistent problem, it's going to be helpful and uh, you're likely to be more successful as a school leader as, as a result. So using the example of behavior, um, if you become uh, successful at managing behavior in a really expert way, um, that's going to be a, a helpful thing that's going to contribute towards your department or your phase or your school or your group of schools to be more successful. So um, here we're going to share uh, seven persistent problems of school leadership, uh, and these are uh, seven underpinning problems uh, that we think um, are pretty comprehensive and drive the work that, that leaders do and they're a starting point for a uh, curriculum that, that we design to help train and develop uh, leaders. So the first is about purpose. Uh, I'll do this quite quickly. There's a link that we'll share at the end of the presentation where there's a blog with some more information about these. Um, but purpose, so leaders uh, set directions in a school, they set goals and um, they create a common purpose and they enlist staff contribution. contribution. Uh, they create a supportive and a professional school culture uh, where there's good opportunities for professional development. People, um, people develop as a, as a result and they often, uh, as Jen highlighted earlier, are happier and want to, to stay uh, in their roles. Retention is better uh, as a result. Uh, the problem of the curriculum. So, so in every school, uh, the leaders are thinking about the curriculum, how you organise it, how you sequence it, and then how you staff it and teach it in a way that aids pupil learning. Behaviour. Um, so again, an unavoidable uh, problem in all uh, uh, settings that leaders are attending to pupil behaviour uh, and wider circumstances. And the problem of, of improvement. So this is uh, leaders identifying uh, problems, areas that, uh, for improvement, and how they then plan and implement strategies uh, for, for improvement, and they, they evaluate those. The administration aspect, so again, across all areas of leadership, um, there is an element of ad 
um, like running a good organization, running a good department, being legally compliant, um, making sure that things are, are done in the, in the right way. Uh, and of course, uh, developing oneself, our own sort of expertise, and um, being able to, to self-regulate, which is something that Jen will talk about in a bit more uh, detail next. So these are seven persistent problems of school leadership. So we've set out that we think um, uh, experts are people who can um, respond in fast, fluid and flexible ways to uh, the persistent problems of their roles. And they, they are less likely to be distracted by the surface features, such as the examples that, that we laid out in the Johnny Wilkinson example. Um, and that thinking about persistent problems is a, a helpful way of thinking about the purpose of the work that school leaders do. And I'm going to hand back to Jen now, who's going to talk about how we can equip school leaders to respond effectively to these problems. Thanks, Tom. Um, and so to come back to our model, we're now going to have a look at um, the idea of knowledge. And, and to do this, we draw really heavily from the work of Carl Bereiter and Marlene Stradamalia, who in their 1993 book, uh, Surpassing Ourselves, write that. And we think this is a really important point because often when we talk about knowledge it can feel quite cold uh, and quite disconnected from really important aspects of our work like uh, building relationships or, or, or working in collaboration with others but drawing upon Bereiter and Scardamalia's broad view of knowledge um, it helps us to address this problem and they describe four categories of knowledge and the, the, the categories that can be hard to get your head around um, initially so we're going to give an example and then on the next slide we're going to talk about what they actually look like uh, in practice. So the first category is formal knowledge um, and when people use the term knowledge generally they, they mean formal knowledge. It's the sort of knowledge that can be found in, in books. Um, it can be discussed, it can, it can be critiqued, it can be compared and it can be relatively and um, easily directly taught. Informal knowledge um, emerges from formal knowledge um, and it, it's knowledge which is quite difficult to codify. It's quite difficult to kind of formally write in a textbook, or, although it can be codified if the right attention is paid to it. It can be thought of as the way that experts translate their formal knowledge into personal uh, models or principles that are relevant to their work. Studies have shown that uh, when, when presented with, with virtually anything, uh, people will rate it as good or bad or positive, negative, strong or weak. And in, impressionistic knowledge is, is, is largely thought to be the, uh, the feelings that are associated with the knowledge that you have. Um, so impressionistic knowledge is very much developed through experience. Uh, and, and a good example would be um, the knowledge that you have about the people that you know. And self-regulatory, it's, it's not about um, doing the job that you do, it's about knowing how to manage yourself in order to do the job that, that you do. And, and this broad view of knowledge is, is really important because it encapsulates so much more than knowledge of HR or finance or, or assessment, or, although of course those, those things are really important. Um, and and to, to flesh out a little bit more um, what this looks like in practice, we spoke to um, one of our, our senior leaders. So this is John, um, John Hutchinson, who works uh, at Breach Academy Feltham and he's a visiting fellow um, at Ambition Institute. Uh, and we talked to him about his, his work uh, on curriculum. So when it comes to John's formal knowledge, um, he recognised that it's a, it's a very difficult bucket to kind of fully capture. Uh, he, he felt his formal knowledge has developed over, over many, many years, but particularly um, <coughs> over the last seven years. Uh, and, and he's done this through engaging with, with other sources of formal knowledge. So, for example, through um, his master's degree um, and, and various texts that have shaped his thinking. John's informal knowledge has come from working across two different contrasting school settings. Um, and it can be really hard to codify the sort of knowledge that, that is acquired from, from working in, in school because it, it's often tacit, it's often very much just based on our experience. But over time, using his formal knowledge, he developed his informal knowledge um, through, for example, creating a set of curriculum principles 
but he 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 felt reflected the um the, the sort of the bedrock of, of an effective school curriculum once he'd done this he he began at looking at, he began um, to look at kind of different curriculum programs which he thought would reflect um, the, the, the curriculum principles or the informal knowledge that he had developed. And, and to lead this work in school, John's impressionistic knowledge was essential. Um, early on, he, um, he talked to people uh, using quite a theoretical approach, which he realised wasn't having the impact that he wanted it to have. So he changed tack to focus on the benefits of, of the approach to um, his colleagues and also to um, ultimately to the children that he uh, he works with by by better articulating um, the importance of a, a rich and carefully sequenced curriculum for for his pupils. Essentially, he came to better understand his audience and and use this knowledge to better support his colleagues. And as you can imagine, John prioritizes and, and commits a huge amount of time to his personal development, and and it's a development that he um, acknowledges is is nowhere near finished. Indeed, he's 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 very much moving along that. Um, novice to expert continuum. One, one particular decision that um, John has made was to stay in, in the classroom and um, because he feels that it's really important to personally be able to put his ideas into practice. And so we include these, the, the description of these four categories for two reasons. One, because knowledge is much broader than we might first realise. It includes what we know, what we believe, what we understand about, about every aspect of our lives, um, the people, our, our relationships, our, our work, and, and, and all shaped by the experiences that we've had. And secondly, we want to dispel the myth that knowledge is, that expert knowledge is, is in some way uh, mysterious or, or unobtainable. Uh, and whilst it's of course true that non-experts also possess um, the, this knowledge in, in some way, shape or form, what, um, what is different between novices and experts, Breiter and Scardamalia argue, is uh, in, in how much knowledge experts have, uh, how well integrated it is, and also how effectively it is geared to performance. And so to recap, we've looked at persistent problems, we've talked about knowledge, next we're going to have a look um, at mental models. And evidence suggests that um, expertise is, is largely due to the mental models possessed by an individual. And mental models can be thought of as what people know and how that knowledge is organised to guide action. And this is really good news because everyone can develop their mental, mental models and so everyone can become more expert. So let's take a look at a mental model in practice. So imagine you're going into a restaurant uh, in a country uh, where you don't speak the language. And the waiter comes over says something, looks at your party of four people uh, uh, and, and you hold four fingers up tentatively. Uh, the waiter says something else and walks away and, and instinctively you, you follow uh, and you end up seated at your table. The waiter hands you menus, uh, asks you a different question and, and this time you start by sharing your drinks order. And you're able to do all of these things because at a very simple level you have a mental model for this situation. Uh, you, you have knowledge about what's likely to happen um, and you can use that knowledge in order to guide your actions and guide the decisions that you make. And so mental models, they enable you to navigate the situations that you encounter. Uh, they guide your perception, your behaviour. Um, they're the thinking tools that enable you to, to make decisions and, and solve problems. And expanding your set of mental models is done through applying bodies of knowledge to the persistent problems that you face. And if we think about what, these, what this might look like in school, uh, as, as experienced teachers and leaders, just looking at these photos is likely to conjure up uh, what you might need to do in each situation. So from canteen management to giving feedback to a teacher, it's the way that your knowledge is organised to guide action. And for an experienced leader who has very well developed mental models, they can bring their knowledge to bear to situations like these, that the situations are likely to be much less daunting. For novice leaders, of course, it's a different story. And so we think it's really important to better understand how to grow individuals' expertise. And ultimately, that's what we're aiming to do. 
And I'm going to hand back to Tom to uh, close this out. Thanks, Jen. Um, so, in summary, um, we set out the, um, uh, some of the, the, the broader points about school leadership, about the, um, the difference between sort of generic and, and more domain specific uh, approaches. Um, we've looked at expertise and the expertise. Uh, experts are people who respond well to the persistent problems of their role. Um, and now we've seen how um, creating rich mental models that are rooted uh, in a broad view of knowledge, um, organized around persistent problems, can be a, a, a helpful way to think about um, professional development. Um, so important to say, there's, there's still loads that we, that, that we don't know. Uh, and that we're still uh, learning about and we're trying to get uh, lots better. So I wanted to, to share these five things with you to, to finish. Um, the first is understanding more about what these persistent problems look like uh, in different leadership roles. So we're really interested um, and we'd love to hear from, from, from people who watch this presentation uh, about how they might, um, how some of those persistent problems might manifest themselves in, in their settings, how they might uh, look different. Um, uh, and how people draw on, on different knowledge and expertise to, to respond well to them. And we also think it's um, a, a useful thing for us to try and establish more of a, a structured body uh, of knowledge which, which leaders can draw upon to, um, uh, as they go and, and become leaders in different settings. And this is something actually we, we think we're quite uh, enthused about. Uh, developments like the specialist MPQs at the moment which are, which are happening and um, the idea of uh, MPQ development uh, next year, where we might be able to sort of codify some of this, um, this knowledge that school leaders need to be able to uh, know uh, and uh, set out the specific things that they're able to do. Um, thirdly, that we don't overlook the importance of context. So in the Nichols definition of problems, demands and constraints, um, understanding those constraints are, around persistent problems is really important. And so uh, making sure that we pay lots of attention to uh, gaining knowledge of the school, the people in the school, the existing practices uh, in the school is, is really important as well. Uh, and a challenge for us that we think all the time about is about how we sequence and structure the professional development of school leaders. So not just um, what things we want to, uh, we think we should um, train them and how we should do that, but, but in which order, what comes first, how much of it, how do we create opportunities for people to learn skills, apply them, make sense of them, uh, refine them and become more expert uh, in that way. And finally, this importance of domain specific expertise. So um, being really respectful of uh, those who have specialist knowledge and expertise in certain uh, areas. It's a precious commodity uh, in, in schools and that we're respectful of that and that we we're able to distribute um, leadership around where there is uh, expertise within a school to help make uh, right decisions and, and, and work together uh, in the right ways to, um, uh, to, to respond to those persistent problems. Okay, so amazingly, we've finished five minutes ahead of time. This is a, a record first for, for me and Jen. We might even have time for some, for some questions. Uh, before we do, we'll, we'll leave this slide as an invitation to stay in touch. We hope you've enjoyed uh, our talk today, we've, we've got through an awful lot. Um, we'll explain this in a bit more, some of these concepts in more detail in the Research Ed uh, Guide to School Leadership, which is, which is coming out hopefully uh, in the next month or two. Uh, thanks very much for coming on and listening uh, to our talk. And Helen, I think we're going back to you for some questions. Is that right? Yes, but you've got very little time, so you need to be very quick. Very quick. Okay, so what advice would you give a head in the first year of headship? Uh, quick fire, quick fire. Don't, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Um, settle in for, for the long haul. Uh, make good connections uh, with lots of people um, and, and keep learning. There's like so much to learn. I mean, at one point I think it's worth making is like, when we talk about organizing knowledge that leaders need to learn, we can only ever quantify such a small proportion or a proportion of all the possible things um, that leaders will need to learn. And so much of that happens in their, their context. Thank you. Um, are many leaders extrovert? 
And how do introverts manage to get heard? Jen. Yeah, <laughs> good, good question. So uh, they, as, as kind of psychological constructs, um, introversion and extroversion are, um, yeah, uh, kind of contested to, 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 to some extent. They, they're thought to be largely fixed, so they're part of the what you might call the big first, the big five personality traits. So um, openness, conscientiousness, agreeableness, extroversion, and neuroticism. I think they are, um, and it's. For me, I think rather than thinking about um, in, introverts and extroverts, it's helpful to, to think about, you know, what it is that people know, uh, what it is that people kind of understand about their context and how they can bring that to bear around the um, persistent problems of their role. But very much kind of what we've talked about here, because um, what we don't want to do is, is preference a particular type of, of, of individual um, in relation to kind of whether they are introverts or extroverts, I think both. Are, are of that value and both can be um, successful. Uh, it might be in slightly different ways, but fundamentally, if we're talking about people who have really a really solid understanding of um, the, the you know the work that they need to do and a really good knowledge of how to address some of the biggest challenges in their role, then to some extent, um, it, it doesn't. It hopefully doesn't matter whether you're an introvert um, or an extrovert. They can they can both kind of be be successful. It's about shifting that emphasis, I think. There was an interesting follow up to that question. How do you avoid knowing what good looks like and making mini me's? <laughs> How do you avoid knowing what good looks like? I think it's an answer the second time. Uh, yeah, so I think, um, so if I'm understanding right, uh, I think it's, it's, it, it's helpful to understand um, kind of what, what we think good looks like. You know, we, we, as leaders, we all want to understand, um, you know, ultimately, uh, the impact that we want to have. I think we, we want to avoid um, imitating uh, some of those kind of superficial features of, of other other leaders' behaviour and, and focusing on kind of what, you know what good looks like from a, from a particular leader isn't necessarily what's going to enable us to be uh, really um, effective as a leader. Um, and, and I think again, it's about, it, 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 it comes. I don't want to give the same answer, but it comes back to um, knowing your context, understanding the work that you need to do and having that knowledge to address those problems. And I think actually, if, if that becomes the focus of your work, then rather than focusing on an individual and trying to replicate the characteristics of, of a particular individual, which is really difficult to do, um, you know, as, as, as we've heard from Tom, um, and we don't necessarily want a certain type of person to, to be a leader. Actually, we want leaders who are really competent, really knowledgeable, uh, you know, kind of really expert in, in, in their work. And so by shifting our emphasis to that, hopefully we shift it away from the need to create mini me's and we don't, we don't need to have people kind of following in the footsteps of the leader that they've worked with or the head teacher that they, they've worked with. Mm. So what, what would you say has been the biggest, um, how can I phrase that, the biggest pushback from the established leadership industry, as it's often referred to, considering that, you know, the body of knowledge that you've been talking about, uh, you know, concerning generic leadership has been really quite strong since the 90s, um, has been obviously um, exacerbated. Well, I don't want to use a negative, so it's, it, it's too loaded, sorry. But how do, what kind of pushback have you faced uh, with this kind of slightly different narrative around mm. leadership and developing leadership? Go on, Tom. <laughs> yeah, really interesting. I mean, I think that, where there's consensus, first of all, I think is that um, there is a need to sort of move away from the, the hero head paradigm. That seems like everyone uh, agrees ab about that. Um, and like broadly, I think people have, have, have wel welcomed the, the, the shift, even those who have kind of been uh, advocates of more generic leadership uh, approaches in the past. I think the two sort of bits of pushback I've had which are interesting. One is to sort of claim this as a false dichotomy uh, to say, uh, you know, you're, you're, create, you're creating a polarised debate by saying this and it's going to take us down a sort of traditionalist, progressive, knowledge, skills debate. Um, uh, and I don't think it is a, a false dichotomy because I think like, it's really important that we have a debate and the, cha and the challenge when people say, oh, it's a false dichotomy means it's almost saying you shouldn't really debate this. Um, and, and I think if we can't sort of hold ideas up against each other and see... Um, 
and, and contest them and refine them and, and learn more about um, those things, like how can we make progress? Um, and so that's, that, that's one area. And I think the other one, as Jen mentioned in her talk, is about um, knowledge. So knowledge just has an image problem. Um, that is, you know, when you talk about knowledge as being something that's, uh, that's positive, it's often seen as um, quite, a, quite a cold or, or a negative thing. So I read something where someone had written that, you know, we're not, we're not robots, school leaders aren't, aren't robots. And of course, no one believes that's true. Um, but but that's the, that, they're the kind of um, lines of argument that you sort of get to. It feels like you're neglecting um, some of the softer uh, the kind of emotive parts of school leadership which we think are really important by the way like and um uh, we also think like almost entirely we're overwhelmed with um really great motivated people with a great moral purpose who come and work uh, on our programs um they, like uh, so so for us it's about how we can learn a lot about that and lots of the good things that we've learned about leadership over uh, the, the last years and then sort of look at how we build this uh, expert practice um uh, around that. Thank you. I think I'll squeeze in the last one because uh, it's already noon. So it's a bit long. Would you not say that expertise need time and experience to develop? Where does this leave those NQTs or staff who get promoted far too quickly and their knowledge at times is not good enough to lead? It's a bit loaded again. But we have seen a pattern of, of people getting promoted quite quickly over the last few years. So if I go first and then I'll let Jen, uh, so just quickly, I should say, I, I was promoted too quickly. I, you know, I became a, uh, a leader by accident because um, of the circumstances in a school and people leaving and being asked to do a job before I was a good enough teacher. And I think that it's a really common feature when you talk to lots of leaders, they feel like things for whatever reason happened quickly and they got into a role, you know, a few years um, in advance of where they thought they were. And it's likely to be more of a, a challenge. We've got one of the youngest workforces, uh, teacher workforces in the world, and we've got challenges around retention of leadership. So it's, it feels more likely that we're going to have people getting into leadership roles um, early, early on in their careers. And so it's a really good question, is it? Because if there's a sort of optimum level of experience that you would build up and sort of um, develop your, your practice as a teacher um, before stepping into a leadership role, sort of fast tracking that isn't without risk. One of the things I'm optimistic about is the specialist, that this, this idea of more specialist um, middle leadership. So the idea that you can stay being a teacher, a senior professional, learning more about things like teacher development, curriculum, and, and pastoral um, work rather than kind of stopping being a teacher and starting being a leader which might be seen as learning a different set of things um, so I think that's a that's a positive uh, development but I'll let Jen um, come in. I, I that's a great answer and I think in, in the interests of time we should <laughs> let people escape <laughs> get back to their day jobs um, but yeah I totally agree with what you've said. Okay right thank you um, so uh, what I will do is because there's two quite interesting questions, but I think they are kind of um, addressed in the blog that you referred to earlier and we'll give the link later. So questions around, you know, what mental models do you think are key in developing a senior leader and so on and so forth. Um, but for the moment, I think we're going to close the session. Uh, because as you said rightly, uh, we are way past the time. So um, thank you. Thank you very much, um, Tom. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, and I'm, I'm really quite excited about, about the, those kinds of new narratives around leadership because it's quite refreshing, that's for sure. So thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, bye. And uh, next week, uh, we have Daisy Christodoulou um, talking to us at 11 on Monday. So um, do join us for that. Um, and in the meantime, have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Bye.